Why are Filipinos so poor? In the 50s and 60s, the Philippines was the most envied country in Southeast Asia. What happened? By F. Chenille Jose. What did South Korea look like after the Korean War in 1953? Battered, poor, but look at Korea now. In the 50s, the traffic in Taipei was composed of bicycles and army trucks. The streets flanked by tile roof low buildings. Jakarta was a giant village and Kuala Lumpur a small village surrounded by jungle and rubber plantations. Bangkok was crisscrossed with canals. The tallest structure was the Wat Arun, the Temple of the Sun, and it dominated the city's skyline. Rice fields all the way from Don Muang Airport, then a huddle of galvanized iron roof bodegas to the Victory Monument. Visit these cities today and weep, for they are more beautiful, cleaner, and prosperous than Manila. In the 50s and 60s, we were the most envied country in Southeast Asia. Remember further that when Indonesia got its independence in 1949, it had only 114 university graduates compared with the hundreds of PhDs that were already in our universities. Why then were we left behind? The economic explanation is simple. We did not produce cheaper and better products. The basic question really is why we did not modernize fast enough and thereby doom our people to poverty. This is the harsh truth about us today. Just consider this. Some 15 years ago, a survey showed that half of all grade school pupils dropped out after grade 5 because they had no money to continue schooling. Thousands of young adults today are therefore unable to find jobs. Our natural resources have been ravaged and they are not renewable. Our tremendous population increase it's up all of our economic gains there is hunger in this country now our poorest eat only once a day but this physical poverty is really not as serious as the greater poverty that afflicts us and this is the poverty of the spirit why then are we poor more than 10 years ago James Fallows, editor of the Atlantic Monthly, came to the Philippines and wrote about our damaged culture, which, he asserted, impeded our development. Many disagreed with him, but I do find a great deal of truth in his analysis. This is not to say that I blame our social and moral malaise on colonialism alone, but we did inherit from Spain a social system and an elite that on purpose exploited the masses. Then too, in the Iberian Peninsula, to work with one's hands is frowned upon and we inherited that vice as well. Colonialism by foreigners may no longer be what it was, but we are now a colony of our own elite. We are poor because we are poor. This is not a tautology. The culture of poverty is self-perpetuating. We are poor because our people are lazy. I pass by a slum area every morning. Dozens of adults do nothing but idle, gossip, and drink. We do not save. Look at the Japanese and how they save in spite of the fact that the interest given them by their banks is so little. They work very hard, too. We are great show-offs. Look at our women, how overdressed, overcoiffed they are. And Imelda epitomizes that extravagance. Look at our men, their manicured nails, 
their personal jewelry, their diamond rings. Yabang, that is what we are. And all that money expended on status symbols on Yabang. How much better if it were channeled into production? We are poor because our nationalism is inward looking. Under its guise, we protect inefficient industries and monopolies. We did not pursue agrarian reform like Japan and Taiwan. It is not so much the development of the rural sector, making it productive and a good market as well. Agrarian reform releases the energies of the landlords who, before the reform, merely waited for the harvest. They become entrepreneurs, the harbingers of change. Our nationalist icons like Claro Embrecto and Lorenzo Tanada opposed agrarian reform. The single most important factor that would have altered the rural areas and lifted the peasant from poverty. Both of them were merely anti-American. And finally, we are poor because we have lost our ethical moorings. We condone chronicism and corruption and we don't ostracize or punish the crooks in our midst. Both cronyism and corruption are wasteful but we allow their practice because our loyalty is to family or friend, not to the larger good. We can tackle our poverty in two very distinct ways. The first choice, a nationalist revolution, a continuation of the revolution in 1896. But even before we can use violence to change inequities in our society, we must first have a profound change in our way of thinking, in our culture. My regret about EDSA is that change would have been possible then with a minimum of bloodshed. In fact, a revolution may not be bloody at all if something like EDSA would present itself again, or a dictator unlike Marcos. The second is through education, perhaps a longer and more complex process. The only problem is that it may take so long and by the time conditions have changed, we may be back where we were caught up with this tremendous population explosion which the Catholic Church exacerbates in its conformity with doctrinal purity. We are faced with a growing compulsion to violence but even if the communists won, they will rule as badly because they will be hostage to the same abstractions in our culture. The barcada, the bolting egos that sundered the revolution in 1896. The hook revolt in 1949 to 1953. To repeat, neither education nor revolution can succeed if we do not internalize new attitudes, new ways of thinking. Let us go back to basics and remember those American slogans. A Ford in every garage, a chicken in every pot. Money is like fertilizer. To do any good, it must be spread around. Some Filipinos taunted wherever they are, are ashamed to admit they are Filipinos. I have myself been embarrassed to explain, for instance, why Imelda, her children, and the Marcos cronies are back and in positions of power. Are there redeeming features in our country that we can be proud of? Of course, lots of them. When people say, for instance, that our corruption will be banished, just remember that Arsenio Lacson as mayor of Manila and Ramon Magsaysay as president bought a clean government. We do not have the classical arts that brought Hinduism and Buddhism to continental and archipelagic Southeast Asia. But our artists have now ranged the world, showing that we have done with Western art forms and rich with our ethnic traditions. Our professionals, not just our domestics, are all over showing how accomplished a people we are. Look at our history. We are the first in Asia to rise against Western colonialism, the first to establish a republic. 
recall the battle of Tyrad Pass and glory in the heroism of Gregorio del Pilar and the 48 Filipinos who died but stopped the Texas Rangers from capturing the president of the First Republic. Its equivalent in ancient history is the Battle of Thermopylae, where the Spartans and their King Leonidas died to a man defending the pass against the invading Persians. Rizal, what nation on earth has produced a man like him? At 35, he was a novelist, a poet, an anthropologist, a sculptor, a medical doctor, a teacher, and a martyr. We are now 80 million and in another two decades, we will pass the 100 million mark. 80 million, that is a mass market in any language. A mass market that should absorb our increased production in goods and services. A mass market which any entrepreneur can hope to exploit, like the proverbial oil for the lamps of China. Japan was only 70 million when it had confidence enough and the wherewithal to challenge the United States and almost won. It is the same confidence that enabled Japan to flourish from the rubble of defeat in World War II. I am not looking for a foreign power for us to challenge, but we have a real and insidious enemy that we must vanquish. And this enemy is worse than the intransigence of any foreign power. We are our own enemy and we must have the courage, the will to change ourselves.